Hello and welcome to Beth Rigby Interviews. Now my studio is a little bit different today because I'm in a much more exciting theatre than Westminster in some ways because I'm here at Villa Park, home of Aston Villa, to talk about the future of football and English football. Hasn't it had a few very turbulent years? The controversial and short-lived breakaway European Super League caused ruptures in the game and exposed a disconnect between top clubs and fans. Owners took the blame. But is the idea of a breakaway league really dead? Or could the Premier League's global investors have bigger plans in the future? Aston Villa's chief executive, Christian Parslow, has had a long career in football, having previous worked at Liverpool and Chelsea. He was vehemently against the Super League and has big thoughts on club ownership. We sat down to discuss all of that and much more. All right, Christian, we're at Villa Park. I've never been here before. Um, and my eye has been drawn to this giant trophy. Yeah, well, rightly so. That is the... The cabinet. Yeah, that's the European Cup, its original name. Yeah. The tournament, as you know, is now called the Champions League, but yeah. we're one of five English clubs to have won it. 1982, 1-0 against Bayern Munich. Uh, yeah. The proudest moment in our club's history. Do you want to have a sit in the dugout? I actually do, yeah. <laughs> Could you tell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, excuse me, have you cleaned Beth Rigby's seat? Oh, she, yeah. She wants to be Who Mr Emery. Who sits here? Well, Mr Emery, here yeah. we go. There you go. You sit there. I'll, yeah. be your, uh, I'll be the opposing manager. I wouldn't... If I was a manager, though, I wouldn't be sitting here, would I? I'd be out there... In your technical ...running area. up and down like a nut. So why don't you have a little bit of... So, this is, so the manager sits here. Yeah. The, the subs are here. Subs and coaches, lots of coaches. Have yeah. a little... And then... And then when they're playing, they come out here and go nuts. Well, does some are more expressive than others, but Does yeah. Mr Emery go nuts? Is he a bit calmer? He's pretty expressive. Do you ever go nuts? What, in my seat? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do. So not one <laughs> final do. question, Chris. Mainly when we score. When you're, when you're, when you're the CEO and, um, you know, you're passionate about the club, but also there's a financial incentive, right, to get into European football, um, is it really unpleasant watching a match? Well, that's a really interesting word. It is definitely not pleasure um, <laughs> until and unless the game is won. It's so lovely when on occasions your team has, let's say you're 3-0 up with 10 minutes to go. That is a different watching experience to most of the time as a Premier League exec where the outcome is in the is up in the air and it is more stressful than pleasurable. And given that um, you are close to European qualification, yeah. do you think that the remaining, how many games have you got? Six or yeah. seven games of the Six. season? Do you think it's going to take a few years off your life? <laughs> to this season worrying about it? I don't think so. I don't think so. So you're in a nice place at the Much moment? Much nicer place. Well, look, thank you for showing me your absolutely stunning ground. It's beautiful. beautiful isn't it? Now, you're a football businessman and you run Aston Villa, um, but as all football fans know, uh, it's about passion football, isn't it? Not the bottom line. So the first question I had for you is, who did you support as a child? Which football team? I supported Liverpool. I, had, um, I was a third generation. My grandparents and my father were from Liverpool and Liverpool fans. And so like many, many football fans in the country, one grows up as a kid following in your dad's footsteps. So you... You backed Liverpool as a kid, and then when you were running Aston Villa, um, you had Steven Gerrard here, didn't you, as the manager of Liverpool legend. Now, running a club's also about tough decisions, isn't it? And, and you had to sack Steven as manager, um, a club that you support and that you supported. used to run, supported. Was that, a tough, was that very tough for you? Yes, it was. It was very tough. He's a very good. He's a very good person. I've known him a long time. When I when I was at Liverpool, he was the captain of the club. But um, my priority is Aston Villa and doing the right thing for our club. And it hadn't worked out for Stephen. He'd be the first to admit that. And um, we have to do the right thing. And the board thought about things. I think I think we let things ride for a while and then made that tough decision and um, and moved on. 
And you've moved on, actually, with great success, haven't you? Because you got um, the former Arsenal manager, uh, Emery, to join. It's been a huge success. You're giving me a little smile there, because I bet you didn't really expect that to happen but a few months ago, right? Well, it's fair to say the improvement has been really dramatic, pronounced and, and, and faster than anyone would reasonably expect. We knew what we were getting in terms of his track record and profile, but the speed with which he's improved people individually has been pleasant, is surprising. Um, you've also got ex plans to um, expand the stadium as part of the UK and Irish 2028 uh, bid for the Euros. How big are the ambitions for Villa Park? We need to modernise and bring the stadium into the 21st century. We also have, would you believe, 33,000 people on a waiting list who can't watch their beloved Villa. So it's incumbent on us to grow the capacity of the stadium. Mm -hmm. The stand you're sitting in, this north stand, mm -hmm. will come down. Mm -hmm. It currently has about 6,000 seats. Post-rebuild, a completely new north stand, will get the capacity up to 50,000. And as you mentioned, that's really mm -hmm. important because to host uh, international tournaments, UEFA tournaments or FIFA tournaments, the specifications are very demanding. And one of them is to have 50,000 seats for, for, for late round games. So, Bringing Villa Park compliant with those regs means we can host a game in the Euros, and that's our dream. After the problems of Euro 2020, are you concerned that UEFA will be th think twice before looking at England now, given what happened, which was horrific? Yeah, it was horrific. I was at the game. Yeah, my, my um, son was there as well, and it was awful. Yeah, well, to answer your question directly, yes, I guess they will look at it, but there are many positives that hopefully outweigh those issues. And as we all do in being football administrators, Sometimes it takes a crisis or a particularly bad moment to, address, to identify and address a problem properly. Let's look at another terrible day at the office for some of the um, Premier League football clubs. I want to just ask you about the legacy of the Super League. Remember six of the biggest football clubs signing up to a plan for a breakaway league that could have killed off the sport as we know it. What was your reaction as CEO of Aston Villa uh, when you heard about those plans? Well, I was quoted on the morning after saying they were grotesque and I, I spoke as a football fan as well as a football administrator. Um, it is deeply regrettable that any people involved in those clubs, and it's been unclear ever since whether it was some or all of the six clubs, but certainly it was an example of where um, clubs can, clubs owners can get disconnected from, from what their fans and even what their players and managers might think. And for anyone at those clubs to think that their fans would like to be shoehorned into a European tournament, not on merit, but on some other basis, no real football fan would tolerate that. And I must say, Beth, um, and this is important in terms of talking about regulation, for me, it was amazingly heartening that the entire football family, fans, clubs, players, managers, even the players and managers of some of those clubs involved, coalesced in less than 36 hours mm. to destroy that concept. Mm. And so, although you're right, it played its part in triggering uh, the so-called fan-led review, mm. in my opinion, that problem was dealt with amazingly efficiently. And I must give credit to government as well. I remember when the government said the next morning we're going to drop a legislative time bomb on these matches. We knew that moment that the concept was dead. Christian, you, you're a businessman as well, right? Just if you've been back at Liverpool or Chelsea, are you really telling me that seeing the financial prize that other clubs were signing up to, you wouldn't have gone into the Super League if you'd had the opportunity? Yeah, I am saying that. You really wouldn't have. Well, in my job, let's remember, I'm, you know, I'm the chief executive of the club. My job is to be the eyes and ears of ownership on the ground. And I would have told my owners that our fans will not approve of a concept that goes against the very essence of English football for the last 150 years. Do you think now that the European Super League is dead or is it resting? I think it's dead and that is because, again, in the wake of it, and I mentioned this when we were talking earlier about, about a different example of a crisis in football, crises tend to galvanise administrators and the reaction to the Super League in all levels of football was profound. Within the Premier League, Beth, mm. we initiated rules, um, black and white rules, an owner's charter mm. that makes quite explicit if any executive of any club tries to enter an unregulated tournament going forward, that club 
will suffer huge points deduction. Christian, I want to ask you about ownership, football ownership. You know, you're one of the few people that have really experienced this at executive level, running some of the biggest clubs uh, in the country. First at Liverpool, and then from Liverpool, you, then you went to work for Chelsea with, with Roman Abramovich. And he's, if you like, the sort of original sports washer and that he used his status as owner of a Premier League club to normalise relations with Russian oligarchs with links to Putin. Of course, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And at the time, there wasn't issues around Abramovich, but subsequently, we've seen what's happened with the war and, and what's happened to him. At the time, do you remember, did you have qualms for going to work for him back then, or was it just a very different world? Yeah, I did. I most definitely did. Um, I don't regret it um, in the sense that, you know, I had a very... That club had reached a point, and I think it was about 11 years into Roman Abramovich's tenure at the club, a very, very significant period in the history of English football because, as you say, it really was the first takeover of its type. It's now become much more topical. But for much of that period before financial regulation came into play, really, Mr Abramovich was financing the transformation of that football club's fortunes on and off the field with his own money. Um, and he had plenty of money, and so it had a dramatic impact on improving Chelsea's fortunes. Mm. Um, by the time I arrived, round about the time I arrived, in a strictly business role, the rules were biting, the rules that basically sit here today, not, off, not understood by everybody, but that fundamentally, in fact, are designed to prevent people like Abramovich, mm -hmm. impossibly wealthy people, buying football clubs and transforming, the, transforming their fortunes with unlimited mm -hmm. deployment of their wealth. In retrospect, do you think British football should have rolled out the red carpet for Abramovich? That's a really good question. I think. I think, you know, the same is being said today about Abu Dhabi and Manchester City and about Saudi Arabia and Newcastle. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I haven't thought of it in those terms. That there's certainly, there's, let's put it this way, let's put it this way. Um, you wouldn't find a single Chelsea fan who regrets uh, what Abramovich bought to that football club. I mean, it really was, well, under his ownership, the club experienced absolutely staggering on-field success and uh, most fans care most about that. And the kind of moral dimension of club ownership. Um, did what happened with Abramovich um, change your view? Because I think after the Salisbury poisonings, you did call for the boycott of the World Cup in Russia, didn't you? Yes, I did. I did. So you do think there's a moral dimension to football or football ownership? Well, I think in that particular instance, I think you know, you, you used the phrase earlier, sports washing. Um, in the wake of that particular appalling incident mm. in the UK, in the run-up to that tournament, yeah, I was very clear in my mind that um, great football nations going along with um, that tournament, England, France, Spain, Germany, had, had the capacity, if they chose to deploy it, to really shine a light on what was going on. And, um, yeah, I'm proud of that. And Christian, what do you think about, if I put human rights back in mind, what do you have, what is your view of the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund taking over Newcastle? Well, that ship has sailed. And um, I think, again, I, I mentioned earlier that speaking, in a, you know, speaking as a football administrator, there is nothing in the football rule book uh, that could or would have prevented that takeover. Many people perhaps think there should be and could be, but I think that's pretty unrealistic. Um, you know, if you, think about, if you think about the idea of this country's relationship with friendly states, with allies, nations on which we rely, I was looking, I was looking only yesterday, people are talking a lot about the potential takeover of Manchester United and, and the potential for Qatar to, buy, to be involved in that. You know, this is a country on whom we depend for our energy supplies in the last 12 months. So it seems to me wholly unrealistic to imagine a group of football executives, whether the Premier League board or other clubs, to block takeovers of football clubs when those nations are freely able to trade with our country more broadly. Where I see my role, and this is my really important point of view on this, Beth, is we have to make sure going, that we do not encourage a situation where 
our national sport is radically transformed mm. in terms of its balance, the competition you talked about, by having nations control clubs and deploying un un unlimited wealth yeah. on the field. But are you concerned that there is an unlimited amount of pot of money that can now yes. go into Newcastle? I am. I am. And I think that's a more legitimate concern for a football executive yes. than essentially asking a small group, a very narrow group constituency of football administrators to effectively apply a form of sanctioning to individuals or regimes that no national government has sanctioned. Yeah, let me put it another way then. I, I understand that. Do you think there should be tighter regulation on ownership? Well, because that's that, a good then question. it takes it out of your hand as a you don't you don't you're not you execute a decision made by a government rather than or a regulator rather than taking the decision yourself. Well, you will you will not be surprised to know, and it's an extremely an ex extremely apposite and timely question because the so-called owners and directors test, which is the sole means mm by which football, the Premier League or the EFL, depending on which league the club plays in, that is the only basis upon which the Premier League or EFL rule on a takeover. Mm. Those rules are extremely narrowly defined historically. Basically, criminals or people who have been involved in bankruptcies can yeah. be barred from taking over clubs. Those rules are being tightened. Yeah. But to be clear, they are being tightened with language that is completely consistent with, with law and with you know, in, individuals that are sanctioned in law cannot be allowed to buy football clubs. What we're not doing is having a separate set of football rules that somehow trump or override decisions taken by governments on our behalf. I think that's realistic and, you and think sensible. That that, so you think that the Well, the alternative seems to me to be crazy. In terms of Saudi, the Saudi issue, there, are some, there is a question about whether or not um, the Crown Prince is involved in the actual fund behind Newcastle. It was meant to be uh, separate from yes. the sovereign uh, nation. There's a case in America in which the Saudis are arguing the opposite and that they're saying that, um, that it is a sovereign wealth fund. Um, well, I think it do most think, definitely is a sovereign do, wealth but fund. But do you think the Premier League basically needs to investigate it? Who really is claiming ownership and the links of the Crown Prince to the... Yes, I do, and I think they are, and they would, if there is a contradiction in representations made at the time of the takeover as to the nature yes. of the relationship between the rulers of that country, the Sovereign Wealth yeah. Fund and Newcastle. Of course, the Premier League, I'm sure, are investigating that. Because they won't say publicly if they are or not, but you think they are? I'd be certain they are. But my point, Beth, is, and I don't think this is as well understood, is that even if the Crown Prince himself had stood up on television and said, I am proud that our Sovereign Wealth Fund is buying Newcastle and I'm looking forward to be personally involved because I love football, I love the idea of the Saudi Arabian nation being indirectly involved in English football and I look forward to my first game at St James's Park, there is nothing in the rule book that would have prevented that okay. happening. And I don't think people understand that. Now, if we were talking about, you know, for example, you know, the leader of North Korea, which is a which sits yeah. on a, a sanctioned list, then there would be rules to prevent it. But this is what people don't understand. Football is not going to take a line yeah. on those individuals that's at odds with that taken by our elected government. To Man City, then first club to take serious money from an all state, the UAE, uh, which has a woeful human records rights but you know, record but that's another problem pockets so deep that they've spent billions on a club that now dominate english football as a consequence um you know they've got two first team squads they're probably going to win the league they win the league all the time um isn't the risk that the premier league is becoming simply a battle between those who are willing to spend the most on players rather than what it's designed for which is a sort of a meritocracy and a fight between clubs. Are you worried about that? It just seems so, that it's... So I am with all these profoundly worried about it, and I wish I had put it as well as you just did. Um, it, is, it is a clear and present danger. I'll speak as a football fan. I don't want to look back in 20 years' time and say that I was part of a group that were asleep at the wheel, and in 20 years' time we look back and three teams controlled by nations are the only three teams winning the Premier League mm -hmm. ever again. Mm -hmm. How do we stop that? 
we stop it with what we have today, which is extremely strict financial rules. The city have fallen foul of financial fair play rules are under investigation. And the truth is, isn't it, that nobody thinks anything can be done about it. Um, I don't they can agree act with that. With I impunity. don't agree with that. They continue to, you don't. I don't agree with that. I do agree that there is a widely held opinion, and I share it, that for many years financial regulation has been too lax, too, um, too ambiguous, too complex, therefore too difficult to enforce combined with an unwillingness to enforce. So what... I think that's changing, and you mentioned this earlier, in the wake of the Super League, there have been wide-ranging changes in the way football is run. The Premier League, again, I haven't read this anywhere, Beth, but I really enjoy telling you this, the Premier League now has, for the first time, four independent professional non-executive directors running the board. And it's no coincidence, in the last six, eight weeks, two clubs have been prosecuted for financial rules when nobody had been prosecuted for years. So, so you, I think it's changing. So you think if and you tighten I up the rules... I want it to change. What about, uh, what about the other thing that, uh, in terms of money, which is the transfer levy? Um, the idea of a transfer levy on international players coming in or transfers between Premier League uh, players. What do you think of that proposal? Well, this is just a different way um, to transfer money within the ecosystem of English football. I think it's a really good idea. I mean, think of in more your world than my world, but you know, when we brought in what seemed at the time to be very high rates of stamp duty on the property market, they yeah. took the heat out of the very yeah. top end of the property market. So you back so it. So I think it would be a very good methodology. It's not but in the white paper. No, but that's that's another issue. You know, I don't believe that it makes any sense whatsoever for a regulator, an appointed, um, a politically appointed regulator, to be delving into the way in which we distribute monies within English football. Leave that to the football authorities. We currently distribute it by a simple transfer of revenue. So right now, over 500 million pounds goes from the Premier League into the lower pyramid. Mm. Literally, four and a half million pounds to every championship club. It's but called you, solidarity. I think the issue here, Christian, is that talking about a new regulator, a government regulator, that you, you know, you're saying that's already heavily regulated. Isn't it, you've actually said that too powerful a regulator also risks killing the golden goose. Yeah. But isn't the problem that the golden eggs aren't being shared out fairly? Well, I think, I think two things. Firstly, um, we are already in negotiations to increase those handouts. OK, let's be clear. That's what they are. They are simple transfers of wealth from the top of the league down the pyramid. And it's the right thing to do. And it's the right thing to do because it hasn't been modernised for far too long, Beth. Teams come out, you, you understand that we're co-dependent on, we're co-dependent on each other. Teams come out of the Championship into the Premier League and they're bridging a huge gap in terms of their TV income. And what the New Deal is trying to do is to help reduce that cliff edge effect when teams go up and down, mm. promoted and relegated. I don't need a government official to tell us how to do that or to do that. We're doing it anyway. Yeah, but, you know, you know the, the dangerous smaller clubs you know, risk going bankrupt as well. I mean, it seems to me that you seem OK with a regulator to be involved in financial sustainability. I do. But you don't want it to go much further. It's sort of almost like a bit of a toothless regulator. You don't seem to want any more redistribution of money from rich to poorer clubs. Or you said you don't want a regulator to meddle in sporting sanctions. In a way, it's... De I don't. I really don't. But we, it seems like we're having a debate and concern about the way in English football's going and the way in which kind of super wealth's embedded in the league. But then you're also saying to me you think it should be business as usual. No, I'm not saying it should be business as usual. I'm saying that there has been a very significant change in the governance of football in the last two years. Strengthening of rules, concrete regulations to prevent some of the very thing. You know, the Berry takeover is always cited as a catalyst for a regulator. There were flaws in that uh, EFL rule book that enabled a takeover that was ultimately destructive to happen. Those rules have been shut. We talked about the ESL, Beth, being essentially destroyed in 36 hours and new rules that apply a 30-point deduction for any club looking at joining a Super League again. 
So mm. we're taking isolated moments, really bad moments in English football. They've been dealt with. And then that being a case for an ongoing and permanent regulator. I like the idea that the government wants to be involved in our national sport. These are hugely important institutions in their communities, economically and socially. So it's right they're interested. But yes, I'm listening to government and light touch, intervening in real crises, focusing on the need and not creating problems or providing solutions to problems that have already been fixed. So the only thing you actually really want is limits on how much incredibly deep-pocketed uh, owners can spend in the transfer market. Is that basically what you want? No, I'm saying that for, if you mean from a regulator, I think it's more likely that a regulator, Beth, will have a more valuable role to play in the lower levels of football where, where let's face it, money is tighter, the pool of people wanting to take over football clubs is much narrower, the quality and experience of management willing to go into those businesses is less experienced. That's where I think government have a legitimate role to play in focusing on the sustainability of lower level football. I just don't see how you're going to stop this big excess money in a way creating a tier of football teams within the Premier League that just beat everyone else because they can afford to. I just, I don't, nothing you've said to me today explains to me how you think for the good of the league you can well, stop that happening. Well, I'm sure if, um, you know, you're, 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 you asked me about Manchester City, I'm sure Manchester City, if their CEO is sitting here today or their finance director, he would tell you every Monday morning he's looking at a set of financials where they're looking at their position in financial fair play. Financial fair play rules, which have been in, in ten year, for 10 years, are change, have changed the way the clubs run better. I assure you, I've run three clubs. Mm. Every Monday morning, I get my weekly finance report, and there is a line, compliance with financial fair play, which in plain English, Beth, means how much money you are allowed to lose. It is controlled. What I'm suggesting to you is those rules may need to get stronger. They may, may need to be policed even more effectively. But we have a system of financial regulation, and it is designed to make sure people do not overspend. That's where we are in football today. One more thing then. You think that the Premier League's at an inflection point now, that either if you get it right now, you, you guarantee the sustainability over the next decade, and if you don't, we're going to have a league in which doesn't reflect what it used I, to be. I absolutely agree we're at an inflection point. If we don't take the right action on those regulations and enforce them properly, the league could look very different in 20 years' time. That is our duty and responsibility as football administrators. And Christian, thank you so much for talking to you. It's absolutely fascinating. And very good luck with your endeavour to get into European football for Aston Villa thank you this very much. season. That's very exciting. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Christian Parslow there, what a fascinating discussion. I hope you enjoyed it. I learnt a lot from it. Well, that's all for this week's show. If you scan the QR code on your screen right now, you can listen to the Beth Rigby Interviews podcast. Each week I take a look at the highlights of my interviews and there are some extra bits and pieces in there too. That'll be on the Sky News app or wherever you get your podcasts. That's all for this week's show in this fabulous setting. Thank you to Christian Perslow for his time and thank you for watching. <laughs>